folks. Great to have Paul Greenberg today. And we're going to talk about something. He's been studying a lot of the younger generation. The old man, Mr. Scrooge, has been studying a lot about the younger generation. That's right. We're going to talk a lot about that. Paul, thank you for, uh, for coming on board. Totally my pleasure. And I'm only studying it, honestly, because I, I need to feel younger than I really am. <laughs> In Next year, I'm going to be going on this massive crusade because I'm seeing a what I'm going to have to call is a seismic generational shift of power. The irony of all these generational shifts of power, by the way, is ultimately when you have all generations end up like their parents. <laughs> but but in the meantime, like, like, those, like those commercials. <laughs> yeah, well, it's all true. Those they're hilarious. Those commercials are awesome. <laughs> Paper tickets. We're off to a horrible start, right? <laughs> Right, I love them. But the, but the reality is this, is, you know, you take a look at the four generations that effectively are in the workforce, you know, the baby boomers, Gen X, uh, millennials, and Gen Z, all right? Baby boomers are leaving the workforce now, finally. Again, we're, I'm guessing we're at least five to eight years too late, but, um, but we're leaving. Um, Gen Xers, at the top levels of corporate power, pretty much that's who's still running the campaign. You know, people in their 50s and late, mid to late 50s are still kind of at the top of the sea level chain for enterprises. But even that's starting to change. They're about this big as a generation and they're contemplating retirement too. I mean, they're contemplating it. They're not retiring yet. Then you have millennials. You know, if I, I had the same view that all baby boomers had early on with millennials bunch of entitled half-formed kids with half-formed brains. They weren't even 26 yet, so be quiet, right? So now they're 40, they have families. They're actually quite intelligent. They're making, making, they're in a position to make important decisions in a lot of places. And they're almost 37% of the workforce, which is by far the largest segment of the workforce in place. The other thing, which is equally important is Gen Z is, you know, when we, when we met Gen Z, basically they were still getting allowances from their parents. Now they're entering the workforce. And you're talking about, I think the number was for North America, but don't, don't know me this, $143 billion worth of buying power from Gen Z, right? Again, it's early for them, but that's a lot of buying power at an early stage. And, and, he, and, thing, and, and between Robinhood and crypto and all that, my God, yeah. they're, certainly, they're certainly leading us into, into some of that. Well, yeah, but, you know, and, and look, I'm an old school guy when it comes to currency. I actually think somebody needs to be behind currency to make it worth anything. But um, but crypto looks like it may actually be sticking. So we'll see. We'll see yet. But, but aside from that, here's the thing. How uh, millennials and Gen Zers operate, how they consume content particularly, is completely different than the way baby boomers and Gen Xers consume content. And that and talk, that's talk a, little, talk a little more about that. They don't read as much. No, it's, it's you know, they don't read as much apparently. Again, you have to always you take all data with a grain of salt because you can find great data to prove anything you want. So, you know, let's just say this. If I'm looking at extant studies, they don't read as much. Or they don't they read, but they don't put as much um, they don't put as much significance into reading as they do how, when they consume other content, but they, they consume a ton of their content this way, right? And literally this way, there's hundreds of channels on here. And that's me, I, I'm, a, I'm a baby boomer, which actually goes to the other point before we get into more details on the content side, the impact that, that millennials and Gen Zers have had on baby boomers and Gen Xers is far greater on the consumption of content is far greater than the impact we've had on them. We've had zero, but we all pretty much consume the way they do. Drill down into that a little bit more. All right. Well, look, still as baby boomers, let's say, we read more and we're going to take, we're going to trust what we read more. Okay. And that's important. It's always a matter of, do you trust your source, right? And do you trust your format too? And how much does your format allow you to retain, right? By how, the way you absorb it, how much does it allow you to retain? This, anything out there that you ever look at the research, um, 
you start seeing the millennials and, and uh, Gen Z is both are very short. The, they're, they're, not, they're not ADHD, which is what everybody tends to turn them into, but their attention span, they, they consume in, by, in, in digestible chunks, short, which is why like my long form writing is not the way they're gonna consume, let's put it that way. They'd ultimately say I'm full after two minutes. They, they, they're missing out on your storytelling. Don't look at it as long form. <laughs> well, no, I'm, they probably don't even want to, if they do, all they do is look at it and not want to read. <laughs> <laughs> My God, that's so long. I'm not going to do that. I got other things to do. The <laughs> other thing with them is, um, with them is that, you know, if you look at studies, you find out, especially younger generations, by the way, um, tend to retain more content when they view it. Um, because they're more impacted by it because it's more of an emotional pull because part of it's because it's designed to be that way, right? And where re reading is, you have to, in effect, create your own emotional pull, which you can do if your writer is an effective storyteller, but, but, um, but there's more effort that needs to be made for that emotional impact. Like, think of a movie that you'll, well, I, I'll give you a perfect example when it comes to... Uh, emotional empathy, which is actually paralyzing level of empathy, is think of an ASPCA commercial. I mean, I can't watch any of them through. I can't. In fact, I hate the ASPCA for putting them on. I can't stand them because for putting them on. It makes you feel too guilty? No, not guilty. I, I feel the pain of those animals. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right? I, I feel it. And I want, I, I look, I do that with videos. Even though I, when I'm watching an animal video where the story is from a very legitimate, let's say, uh, animal rescue place, and I know the story is going to end happily because that's what they put up, but they found the puppy terrified, staring at a wall, couldn't look away, cried all the time, was blind, you know, and you know, you know, if you skip forward to the end, the puppy's not blind anymore. He's dancing around, has a home, and he's happy. But I can't stand watching the beginning because I can't stand that that poor little thing went through that to start with, right? It's a baby. It's a little thing, right? It didn't deserve that. And it's usually because some asshole human did it, right? So, right. And then I want to punch out the human, right? So, but that's what I'm saying. That's a visceral, strong, quick, emotional response. Where when you're reading, it takes longer to build that up. And it takes longer to even get one because your mind has to do all the work, right? Your mind's not doing all the work there. Some of the work's getting done for it. Um, so that's how they retain. So the other side is with these generations, they want to be heard. And so, so, so Paul, this, I mean, you're making, a, you're making a very good point. I mean, very different ways you, we, we ingest content. I think you're going to how that impacts enterprise technology, right? Wow, well, yeah. And you have some views on the vendors we deal with and how they're going to market. Uh, t t talk a little bit about well, how you think they need to evolve. Well, it's pretty straightforward, really, in a way, because ultimately the two issues that they have to concern themselves with, if they understand the consumption pattern, let's call it, of these two generations is how they can create and consume, I mean, create and distribute the content. That's their issue. Certain vendors, obviously, who are dealing, especially in the professional venues, like Adobe, are well, cre well positioned, right? In fact, they're very smart. If you, you know, this year, I spent, so I've spent a lot of time, historically, I've always spent my time with Adobe uh, Digital Experience Cloud, or, you know, that, but in the last two years, I've added Creative Cloud to my uh, analyst portfolio, I'll call it, meaning I actually do go to attend their analyst events. I, I attend Adobe Max and so on and so forth. And I'm meeting with a bunch of people at that level. And because I'm also using Creative Cloud too, so I'm trying to understand it. Um, so um, I, they get creation from an, a well-aligned way. So for example, there's two products they have, one called Behance, and then they have Adobe Bridge. And they're tied into the creative crowd. And what essentially, if you looked at the theme of Adobe Max this year, those two products are actually key in a lot of ways. The theme was connected, connected, creator, connected creators. That was the theme. And that was, you know, for the purposes of Adobe, that's a very smart theme, right? Um, and if you look at the tool sets and you look at the 
process flows and the, you look at the, the, um, the overall like communal efforts they make, they're doing the right thing and they're putting together, you know, from a professional standpoint, they're putting together professionals with agencies, with, you know, enterprises, with practitioner companies, anyone, and they're doing, you know, project focusing it to a large extent. So still follows something of an old paradigm, but at the same time, um, still is doing the right thing on that level. But where Adobe and all the companies- The consumer, the user is certainly the new, uh, younger um, generation that you're talking about, right? So it, for the for the most part, but see where they're missing, although they're starting to understand this, is on the distribution side. So, for example, if you look at Adobe's let's say portfolio of products, there's not, and this might sound really ridiculous, but it's not. Uh, there's nothing for TikTok video creation in it yet, and you know what? They have no option on that one. It's got to come because uh, you have to start looking at what TikTok actually TikTok's incredibly fast rise to a, a impact a, a massively uh, impact bearing uh, 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 channel is is staggering I mean it's staggering and and it really is key to understanding what we're talking about in the future there's a reason TikTok is the best designed algorithm I've ever seen um, there's a, there's a three-part series written by this guy, Eugene Wei, W-E-I, at eugenewei.com on TikTok's algorithm that I highly recommend everyone read if you have any interest in TikTok's algorithm. Um, but it, it really explains it. And I, I ran experiments on TikTok's algorithm based on his article and absolutely to, on point, worked exactly as he said. Basically within hours, as I, I, I did everything, I scrolled, when, uh, for example, when I first joined TikTok, I got the same thing everybody gets, you know, 18-year-old um, men, men and women dancing this shuffle, pretty much. A lot now, of to, videos. <laughs> well, but to their, to their credit, some of them were really good dancers, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, then I started scrolling, and I run across these people doing comedy, let's say. And, they, and there's some amazingly talented young people doing comedy. And they're just amateur kids who are just rolling. But then I started looking even further and I realized, whoa, these are incredibly well-produced videos too. Like, what the hell? What do they, how do they do that? How do they do, I mean, you'd think they spent like months in the studio putting together this movie and then they cut a small piece of it and used it. But no, they're doing it in six, eight, 10, 12 hours. Of, You're still, almost describing what the MTV generation did in the 80s. Well, it's exactly the successor to that, and it's a successor to what happened with YouTube. It's exactly the right, same right, right. pattern, exactly the same pattern. And, and then I began really experimenting. So, for example, I scroll past everything except ads for a vino or something like that, or a Veda ad. Uh, and I just stop on them and I look all over the place. And then I go, scroll to another kind of cosmetics. You know, that kind of, or, or uh, what do they call, uh, whatever they call those things, things like skin exfoliant, you know, those, all those ads. I just go to those ads. And within, I'd say, I don't know, 18 hours, maybe 24 hours, all of a sudden I was getting a ton of related videos to those. Like it could be anything from another ad to another company, but it would also be a TikTok influencer talking about making herself up or, some guy talking about his hair grooming product who wasn't a paid advertiser, was just talking about how to do it. Then I would go to things like, at one point I only followed uh, women dancers who were blonde. They couldn't be brunette, they couldn't be redhead, they couldn't be any other color but blonde. And the key was blonde, okay? And within 18 hours, 60% of the content I would get had blonde women. I mean, it was just astounding at the number. I think we're approaching too much information here. <laughs> no, no, no. It, I'll tell you, man, as dicey as that sounds, it isn't. <laughs> it's not. It was like amazing how fast the algorithm adjusts. And so, so, so Adobe clearly is ahead of the curve. On that, on, on creation. That. So, so let's talk about some of, the other, some of the others. Well, here's the real point. The weakness for almost everybody, although there are a couple of efforts toward this, is distribution. Almost no company knows how to distribute the content and get it 
in the hands of those uh, users to consume and, uh, or, and understand the media that you need to do it. The one company that's making a limited but important effort is Salesforce right now with uh, Salesforce Plus. Now, if you remember when they announced Salesforce Plus, they announced that you saw two announcements, uh, mostly generated by the tech media. One was Salesforce launches Netflix for business. The other one was Salesforce launches live streaming studio. They didn't launch either of those. Those were completely wrong. I knew what they launched the minute I saw what they were doing. And within two days, Brent and I had the guy who ran that on the players and he confirmed it. They're launching a digital broadcasting network is what they're launching, right? And that's not the same as a live streaming service. Um, we're basically taking effectively what we all grew up on TV and making it digital and then getting it in the format that these young generations all understand and, and can use and consume and then moving it accordingly. Now, two things about that. Though. The first thing is, why would you launch a broadcasting network? Um, well, there's two reasons. One is aggregation of content, sure. right? And that's really obviously mission critical when you're a company or a thought leader or you're something. And the other one is we all grew up on TV, including them. Every one of them, if you want to see, the, there's two things the human species has in common, I think. One is that we all are born looking for a purpose to make us happy. That's the big existential one. And the other one is we all grew up watching television, right? So, and that's pretty much the entire human species. So uh, there is no question of the impact of television on well, the distribution process here. Isn't, isn't it also because it's a little bit of a vacuum, right? Traditional media, the TV, the networks have lost power. There's so many new content providers. Telcos are starting to get in. Media companies like Google are trying to get in. So it almost seems like it's going to be a free for all for the next few years. Or am I, I not getting fair. that right? No, no. It's it's right now we're at that experimental stage of how to do this. Like for example, where Salesforce falls down, and admittedly, is what I see as part of the and one of the big differences in historic TV broadcasting and uh, digital broadcast networks is the element of interactivity and participation from the the watchers, let's call it, you know, the user, the user side. Um, that's critical. Now, Salesforce said we're only right now concerned with content, and they said, and the guy said to me, he said, you, you know, me and Brent, you might, um, you might not like my answer, but we're only concerned with content. I said, you're right. I don't like your answer, but. Uh, I understand this first step and you're working, focusing there. I said, however, I will hound you until you understand participation has to be part of what this is. And so, and that's one of the big differences in this newer broadcast network. Because the other side is, like it or not, millennials and Gen Zers want to be active participants in something, right? In something. They want some say in their own destiny. You know, and millennials, the difference between Gen Z and millennials, apparently, and this is more folklore than it is actual study is you know millennials want a lot of guidance in doing it and gen z don't uh that but you know who wants guidance when you're 18 uh no one right so and they're not following any new path there but but the reality is that um this 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 is what we need to look i'm putting it this way this so are, this, you, are, you, are we are we going to next talk about metaverse i mean when you say participation are we okay. Augmented reality. Are we going to t t tell me where you're headed with that? Well, it's not. It's really not difficult. So let me let me sort of distinguish between interactivity as we normally think of it, and interactivity as it should be thought of with participation. So here's the difference. So you're at watching a conference. There's a speech going on at the conference. There's a chat window open or not a chat, you know, comment window open on the right. There's a moderator for the comment window from the company who's sponsoring that, whatever that speech is. All right, so guy, person's given a speech, goes for an hour. At the end of it, looks to the moderator, say, how many comments we get? They go, 200. And he goes, oh, that's great. And then you look at the comments. Hello from Singapore. Hello from Toledo. Hello from Akron. Hello from San Jose. Hello from Manassas, Virginia. Hello from Boca Raton. And then one person tries to strike up a conversation about something the guy says in the speech and the moderator says, oh yeah, we have a track on that tomorrow at 2.30. The moderator's not a moderator, a traffic cop, right? And so, and then you have people just 
I mean, you get geographic information, I guess that's some data, but the reality is there's no conversation going on. There's no interactivity going on there. There's a bunch of people slapping comments down on a comment stream. There's nothing, there's no participation whatsoever there. But, but, but Paul, isn't that always true? I mean, I see that in all the analysts calls you and I go to, right? AR people love to control that. They're more comfortable with outbound, right? You're right. They're, they're really conversational. Okay, so let me ask you this question. So think of all, we're on a lot of these calls together. So think about, of all the vendors, which one or two don't think that way? There's two that I know you know, because you're on all the calls, who are open about it. As open as you're going to get on a platform like Zoom or... John John Tessick at Salesforce. Right, that's he's one. He's a really good job, right? Yep. And there's one other one, if you think about it, who you know extremely well, smaller, but uh, they got two AR people, one of whom, well, I, I mean, I can give it, I'll just say it rather than you try to get. Zoho is the other one, yes. right? I mean, and if you think about it, we have access to everybody, and I mean everybody, uh, the other analysts, and, and one of the, notice one of the things about Salesforce, um, you can have a conversation that in the chat window is not related to the speech, but it starts kind of going off on a funny tangent and they just let it roll and they join in and then they let it, they kind of bring it back around and, and, it, and they got rid of Slido. So now you're just asking, the, everything's open. And it's so much better environment than when you can't, the only time you know another analyst is on the call is because they, the, the person from the, from the vendor is reading the analyst question and giving them and, and mentioning their name. Other than that, you don't know who's on that call. You have no idea. And it's terrible when that happens. And I, like you, everyone, and this not just AR teams, everyone's got to get used to the fact they're going to have to give up some control. They're going to have no choice. You know, I'll, I'll give you a slightly different perspective. So I've been, I've been running my analyst cam episodes, right? And burning platform. So I've done about 300 episodes in the last- 300? Yeah. Um, and I'm always begging of vendors. I love this presentation. Can I get 15 minutes? It is pulling teeth. It's like, it's there. It's somewhere, it's some archive, it's there. It, it, it's so difficult. It's like, we've, we create this content and we can't seem to be, to your point, we don't know how to distribute. No. <laughs> No. And the idea is, look, you know how Brett and I do the plays? I don't know if you ever watched these specific episodes. So for example, here's, here's one thing that always happens. We use StreamYard currently. We'll be using StreamYard and Restream, uh, but we're using StreamYard right now. And so every single episode, without exception, you'll see one of two things happen. Brent will bring up all the comments. We have a fairly large immediate viewing audience, So, in, especially on LinkedIn. So they're always commenting. Like we did one with uh, Bob Stutz on his retirement last week. And we had, uh, I think it ended up, I don't remember exactly, but it was like 170 comments or something like that. And they were, but they were active, you know, and we would bring them up. And then if there was a question for Bob, we'd bring up the question. In some episodes, what happens is there's, a, there's an active participant in the chat and we really like this way it's going. So we, we well, I'll give you a funny example. We were doing one, uh, who was our guest? I'm completely blocking, I shouldn't be. This was like two, two weeks ago, we were doing one and, oh, oh, it was Liz Miller. Liz Miller was the guest. And um, we, it was really funny. And we had reached this point, we started talking and Josh Greenbaum was watching and Josh made, like he, he said some lyrics to a song and we sent Josh a note saying, uh, would you be willing, would you, would you be willing to come on and sing the song? <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> uh, he said, yes. So we actually literally get, we sent him the URL. We pulled him on the show and he sang it. And then we just kept him there while he was there. We do that a lot where we actually, normally it's just, there's a really good com comment stream going and there's one or two, People are very, very active. So we say, hey, you want to come on? Right in the middle of the show, they are not a planned guest. And we just bring them in. I mean, the idea is, look, man, this is a conversation. And it really is a conversation. I mean, as much as Brent and I may be funny, I'd be sick and tired of me after a while if other people weren't involved, right? So 
you know, we're, we're actually actively trying to make the point. I love it, I love it Paul. So it's gotta, let, gotta happen. Let's talk a little bit more about enterprise and then I wanna talk about big brands and how they're adjusting, okay? So who is, I mean, if, you, if you're comfortable, who is really miserable at adapting to this new world? That's an interesting question because I know everyone's concerned. I mean, keep in mind, anyone who I, wants, I, I, no, I, no, I, I'm not being evasive. It's just I'm my perspective because I've approached every one of them for content and all that. A couple of them just absolutely are terrified by it. Well, a lot, here's the thing. So, as far as um, actual actions taken, almost everybody's miserable at it. I'm not kidding. I mean, Salesforce is one of the very few taking an organized approach that has some promise and it is only at the stage where it has some promise okay it's the, but if i'm i'm i the the tough part here is actually to come up with anyone who's doing it right uh, at all and I, I, I found i found work they actually has been very easy to work with i see I don't, I don't deal with them on that level it's not a matter of me us working with them it's more a matter of how they're looking at consumption uh di distribution and most of them just don't have a plan and and they're trying, but here's the thing. I and, 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 Zoho, and Zoho is always easy. Right. Well, Zoho was built as a participating, it's participation is built into their DNA. I mean, they, they come from such a different perspective. They're an outlier, really. I mean, they really are an outlier. They're, they're extraordinary at so many levels that other companies just can't even fathom, I think. I mean, to me, Zoho is actually with transnational localism and all the other things they're doing now, they're actually, at some point, I actually mentioned this to Shridhar one time. I said, I hope you guys are ready to be transferring, uh, transitioning from a software company to an infrastructure company, because you're on that path. And they really are. Um, and I, I, I find them just unique, uh, and but just so different that I can't even use them the, as a loop. The, the openness. Yeah. The, you know, Sri Dharma has its own style, right? Yep. Philosophical. Raju has his own style. Sandy yeah. has her own style. I mean, yeah. but it just pervades the organization. It's so easy to say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about this. And sure, when, Benny? Yep, exactly. I mean, yes. in, in most other vendors, you have to go through layers of approval. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I, I the things that I know is, look, I mean, I'm sure you're the same. Analyst relations people have a job to do, and they're accountable for us. And there's, look, there's one or two AR people I don't like at all. Um, so I would, let's say this, I respect AR people. I do. And I know because they're accountable for us, even though I'm asking them for a conversation with a person who's been my personal friend for 18 years, I still will go through them only because they're accountable. There was one person, I won't go through any details on it, but I'll say this. I deliberately went around this person so that they would find out I did because I was so pissed off at them. And, uh, and I wanted an apology. I got it eventually. But um, the thing was, unless I'm really furious, which is rare, I will always go through that layer only because it's their job and, you know, and it's their responsibility and it, they have to know what we're doing and that somebody looks badly up at them, right? So it's just a matter there of just to me, and I know you're like that too. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. You're right, you're right. I, I think that's a lot of it. There, there are, uh, each company has its own quirks. I will say this, from the standpoint of strategic thinking, at least from my advisory side, um, almost all the companies are trying to figure out how to do this right. Most of them have not got a really good working plan in place. Several of them are experimenting with things here. And they're like, for example, on a smaller side, you know, uh, Creatio is experimenting with a bunch of things. Um, they tried one thing, which from an event standpoint was sort of unusual, that apparently worked pretty well, although I'm not sure how yet, I'm still digging in with them. A 16 day marathon event. They literally did it for 16 days, but it was, but it was designed, wasn't designed for mass attendance, it was designed, we're doing all this for 16 days, come. There's always, there's a place for you to come, it's organized, there's certain things you can do. We're using an event, software so that you can actually like put it on your calendars and be reminded and there'll be other things done and there will be some couple of really important pieces that you might want to pay attention to they treat it like an event 
but like an like what we used to call an unconference almost. Right. Right. You know, by, by the way, I'm hoping it'll it'll, it'll come back in 2022. I went to a unit four in-person analyst summit. Okay. And I didn't realize how much I'd missed that. Was Partly it really because great? they were very open. The, the, the interaction was very, very open. The CEO was in the room, the investor was in the room, and yet they were no bars, right? And it, it, it kind of brought out in the virtual, how controlled it is that you've got to go yeah. slide yeah. or whatever, right? Oh. So I'm hoping in 2022, we'll have a few more of those in-person, um, you know. Anyway. Freshworks tried that actually with a hybrid event and it went okay. I don't want to say it was great. It wasn't, I don't think, I don't think it was terrible, but it was hard. Like they showed scenes of say Alan and, uh, and um well, I forget, but whoever happened to be in the room with Alan at the time, and they would show that there's maybe eight or 10 analysts who are actually there, and everyone else was virtual. I was virtual. I mean, I wasn't planning on going there, but um, but the problem is, you know, I didn't occur to me till afterwards. It's depressing to see like, you know, 100 seats and eight analysts sitting in the seats. It's actually kind of depressing. Uh, it's like you look at it and say, oh my God, it's like nobody's attending. But I mean, I'm sure they have plenty of analysts attending. Uh, I didn't, you know, I went to whatever analyst thing they were doing, but but the reality was it's really hard to navigate this, that virtual analog 